Good morning, church. Hey, my name is Joe Wickman. I'm our lead pastor here, and I am constantly faced with situations that challenge my faith. There are circumstances that make me doubt, and I have days where I absolutely, definitely feel like God is not near. Are you inspired yet? (laughs) I want to talk about this because some people try to live the Christian life as if it's about making one big decision to believe in Jesus and that after that, you can just somehow kind of put your life and and your faith on autopilot. You know, like I, I believed, glad I did that. But faith isn't a one-time decision. And that, that's not how any relationship works, right? Imagine if I treated my marriage like that. You know, well, you know, Kelsey and I are married now. Glad that's done. Don't have to pay attention to that anymore. Or how about, how about parenting? You know? Glad we had the baby. Whew! Man, and it's like, listen, sometimes husbands, like, come on, like, maybe you need to engage a little more, huh? (laughs) We're told in the Bible this. In Hebrews 11, chapter 1, that that chapter is, is called the Hall of Faith because it recounts how many different people believed in God in extraordinary ways and in everyday ways. Now, faith is the confidence. And so, what's your confidence in the reality of God and his reality as it pertains to your life and your decisions. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. That's where it gets complicated. And we see in Hebrews 11 and and through all sorts of scriptures that people with the greatest faith are not those who make one big decision to trust God, but rather they make throughout their lives lots of major decisions to trust God and be able to make major decisions to trust the Lord in times of crisis. You learn how to do that by trusting God in little ways daily. So just as it did for people in the Bible, you and I both know that life constantly presents challenges to our faith. And you may be here this morning, and you're like, geez, I don't know if I'm doing this right. Because I'm, I'm doubting. I don't know if I'm doing this right. You're like, I don't know if God is really real or if I'm not believing right because I, I have these challenges to my faith and it's hard for me to exert faith daily. Well, I want you to know that this is the testimony of Scripture that people, the greatest people of faith, had to wrestle with the same things you do. And whether or not we persevere in those situations depends on our growing confidence in an invisible God. In Hebrews eleven twenty seven, we read how Moses persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Think about Moses in his life. God appeared to Moses in a burning bush, and he told him to go to Egypt, where 40 years earlier, he killed a guy and tried to cover it up. So he was wanted for murder, and the Lord said, I want you to go to Egypt where my people are enslaved. I want you to go confront Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler in the entire world, And I want you to lead millions of Jews, my people, the Hebrews, out of slavery. Yeah, they've they've been in slavery for 400 some years. But I want you to take a stick and go to Egypt and lead them out. If any of that was going to happen, Moses would have to live as he expected God to show up. The challenges Moses uh, faced required faith. Not just once, but just like in your life, again and again and again. 
I hope you're not trying to live off a spiritual high that you had months or years ago, but that you are engaging God in each new day with the need for fresh faith. Because every week we have to make decisions, every day, whether we live by faith or if we do the opposite, which is to live as if God doesn't exist. Every Monday, we get to answer the question. When you go to work, will I do my job as if I'm working for the Lord and not for this boss or this company? Christians work different than other people. If your work depends on how, how good somebody is or how, how nice they are, and not the fact that you're actually serving the Lord, your faith needs to increase. Every paycheck, like Stephanie just talked about. We spend our money by faith. Now we're getting personal. Do I give God my first and my best? Even in the way we navigate relationships, even in our homes, like in our family dinner, or when you're around your friends who you love, will I engage my family in conversation as if these are the most important people God has given me? Or will I just ignore them and look at my phone? Here's why I want us to engage in these questions of faith, because if we're not mindful, if we don't intentionally choose to live by faith, we can live as functional atheists. I hope you've made the big decision to follow Jesus. And I hope that you will routinely experience, by you stepping forward in faith, the continued consistency of the growth of your confidence in God. If we're not living as if God is real and Jesus is alive, then we need to get our faith back. That's what we're talking about in this week of this series. We're going through a, a book, uh, many of us are reading it, called Get Your Life Back by an author named John Eldridge. And we've talked so far about how the way we pause and pray throughout our day, the way we love others as Christ has loved us, and the way we even remember what God has done in our lives in the past actually grows our life of faith today. So you and I both know that on days when we sense that God is close, and I hope you have those days, faith comes easy. But the author of the book reminds us, sometimes God seems so near, but not always. Other times he seems to have gone elsewhere. It's hard on the heart and soul. I do say seems to, for God never really vanishes. He's always near. So to live by faith, we must remind each other that God is always near. This is a big part of why God has called us to be the worshiping body together. So all throughout the scriptures, and I'm going to warn you in this message, there's a whole lot of content. So, so um, you know, don't worry if you're a little overwhelmed. If you um, want to follow along with the YouVersion Bible app, you just click events and look at our notes and you can make your own notes in with everything that's on the screen. So all throughout the scriptures, the Lord promises his people, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And when you look up that word in the original language, never actually means never. God has not left you. And listen, I know you could have tragic things happen in your life. You could have periods of weeks or whole months where you feel like God is so distant from you, you wonder if you've ever experienced him. But I promise you, because God says it's true, and I know this also from my experience, God has not left you, God has not forsaken you. God is as near you now as he's ever been. This is his promise. When Jesus commissions his disciples to carry on his work after he went to heaven, he said this in Matthew chapter 28. 
the end of the great commission that Jesus gave them and us is this. And surely, Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Addressing the Athenians who worshiped a God they did not know, the Apostle Paul said this in Acts 17. He is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Eldridge writes, God surrounds us. We swim in God like we swim in oxygen. He is right by your side this very moment. Despite this reality, and what a wonderful reality it is, we don't always feel him near. Don't have a constant experience of his presence. So if that's what you're looking for to think that your Christian life is valid, you don't have to feel that way all the time. It can be so disheartening, he says, though. I hate that roller coaster. You ever felt like that? I have. So let's talk for a moment about this idea of God constantly being around us and even in us. Because you can get weird with that. We're not pantheists. We don't believe God inhabits rocks in the same way as he inhabits people. But we do believe that God is ever present and ever available to us. On the night he was betrayed, as Jesus prepared his disciples for, for life without his physical presence, at the last meal he shared with them, Jesus promised them his presence through the Holy Spirit. We read this in John 14. Jesus looks at his followers who has been physically present with him for three years. And he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Wouldn't you like someone to advocate? Not for every little wish you have, but to advocate for you in your relationship with God. Another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. So Jesus was clear, this is conditional. The world that does not believe in Jesus does not experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in the same way that someone who has trusted Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you walk into church And you're like, hey, when I come here, there seems to be the presence of God available to me. When I walk down the hall and I feel the love of the people greeting me, when I come to worship and and somehow these musicians, I'm receiving more than just music from them. It feels like God's doing something in me. And then when I hear God's word, God does something else in me, you're experiencing the Holy Spirit that's available to you when the believing body of Jesus gathers. But what I want for you and what the Lord wants for you is for you to experience that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, by the Holy Spirit of God living in you. This is what Jesus says to those who have had faith in him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I, who was leaving, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you, Jesus says. The new reality that Jesus makes possible is available to us because he sent the Holy Spirit. So no matter how we feel or what we're going through, believers in Jesus never have to be apart from God. Isn't that good news? That's why Paul could pray this for the Christians in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter three, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, 
Do you need God to strengthen you in your inner being? I do. My inner being is weak. It's fragile. It's frayed. It's depressive. It's, it's just raw. And I daily, moment by moment, need, because of the demands that life puts on me, I need to experience God strengthening me in my inner spirit. So that you may dwell, Christ may dwell in your hearts. And how does Christ dwell in your hearts? Through faith. Eldridge summarizes this. We are never apart from God. He is both around us and within us. How much closer can he get? Then he asks the question we're all asking. Why is it then that we don't enjoy the experience of Jesus and his resources on a more consistent basis. The truth is that even with God's promise of the reality of the Holy Spirit living in us through faith, the daily wear and tear of life can cause us to doubt when we feel like God is not near. Eldred records this talk with himself I said to my forlorn soul, feelings, I'm sorry you're not well, but I'm not letting you define my experience right now. I think you are misguided. God is right here, I am his, we are close friends. I'm not sure why I feel low, but it simply isn't true. He then explains, and you may have felt like this, you may feel like this right now. I honestly thought my feelings were a fairly decent report of reality. But my experience of God doesn't have to come and go like I thought it did. If you think talking to your own soul is kind of weird, a little bit out there, there's precedent for it in Scripture. Psalm 42, for example, the psalmist writes this, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Really good news for all of us who feel things strongly, or if we feel the absence of strong feelings. Faith might be accompanied by feelings, but faith is not a feeling. Again, Eldridge says, I don't think we've admitted to ourselves how much belief is a choice. So when the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, one of his disciples, Thomas, doubted. But when Jesus walked into the locked room the disciples were gathered in, he told doubting Thomas, stop doubting and believe. So you can't command your feelings to change. That just doesn't work. But you can choose to stop doubting and begin believing. When you do, everything begins to shift. As long as Thomas doubted, his experience confirmed his doubts. And if you go down that road, listen, I could write down for you in a very convincing manner all the reasons why my senses might tell me that God is not near to me. You may be able to do that too. And when Thomas saw Jesus, Thomas said to him, though, in verse 28, my Lord and my God. So our problem today is that we cannot see God, right? And listen to what Jesus told Thomas in that moment. Because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who, who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's you, or it can be. Too often, we're waiting for God to drop faith from heaven into us. But that's not how it works. Eldred reminds us, faith or belief, God says he rewards it. And it can only be rewarded if it's something we've chosen. 
God doesn't reward you for things he does to you. It's when we feel we cannot see God that we get to choose to believe he is real. He gives us the grace to do it. He empowers us to do it. But he doesn't violate our will. We get to opt in. Peter wrote to believers who were struggling, who were experiencing trials and hardships. In all this, even in the struggle, in all of this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that, and you may need to hear this now, that if you are suffering, if you are experiencing trials, if you are experiencing grief, the wonderful thing about your walk with the Lord is that he will use those. If I'm in pain and I feel like it's meaningless, I suffer much more. If I'm in pain and I trust, even though I don't feel it, that God has a so that there for me, I could endure almost anything. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, listen, more than any money you could ever have, more than, more than your mortgage being paid off, more than any possession, your proven genuineness of your faith is worth more than anything, which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The presence of trials in your life does not equate to the absence of God. And because some of you feel like because hard things are happening in your life and bad things have happened that somehow you must be neglected by God, overlooked, even forsaken. I'm gonna read this again. The presence of trials in your life does not equate to the absence of God. There are people who will tell you that if you obey God, then everything will just be smooth sailing and you'll get the job and everybody will be healed all the time and you're going to have money and he's going to bless your bank account and this will never be that church. Because when I look at the lives of the people in scripture who have followed Jesus most closely, it's not that they had an absence of suffering, it's that they had the presence of God real in their lives, that they believed that Jesus was alive, and so they got to experience through faith the presence of Jesus in their trials. So when hard things happen in your life, and it seems like God is so distant, That doesn't mean God is gone. But listen, as your pastor, I want you to know I feel that sometimes too. It's normal to doubt. But Pastor Sab, our former lead pastor, often reminded us this. There comes a time, and today could be the time you decide. There comes a time when we must believe our beliefs and doubt our doubts. So here's just three things I'd like to equip you with today. One, can we talk about the difference between expectation and expectancy? I want to invite you to believe God wants to give you more of himself. Hey, I hope God gives you more health. I pray for health and healing for people all the time. I hope God helps you get the promotion, that he blesses you financially. I pray for those things constantly, that that the Lord will bless my family tangibly. It's okay. God wants good things for you. But you know what God wants you to experience more of for sure? himself. 
If you could choose between your wish list being fulfilled and more of God, I don't know if you're going to get the promotion. I don't know if you're going to get sick. But I know, and I can tell you with a straight face, that no matter what the circumstances, the cross of Jesus Christ proves that God allowed nothing to stand in between his ability to claim you as his own. And the empty tomb and Jesus distributing the Holy Spirit says that there is nothing in this world, there is no force or power of Satan that can separate you from God. And the difference between expectation and expectancy, I'm being taught this by my pastor right now. When I expect God to move on my timeline, I am often disappointed. When I expect God to fulfill my wish list, it doesn't always happen. And you know what happens? I get bent out of shape because God is not doing my will. And I'm being taught right now in my own spiritual development that I need to shift from expectation, which really amounts to me telling God what to do and when, to expectancy. This is no matter what you do and no matter what, when you do it, Lord, I expect to experience more of you all the way through. So do you expect God to do your will? Or are you living in expectancy of him showing up no matter what? Because God's promise of availability to you does not mean he will always do what you want. But Jesus does tell us in Luke chapter 11, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Can I trust that God when I ask, seek, and knock, is actually going to be good? Meaning, is God good? Is he trustworthy? Jesus continues, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Holy Spirit, God's presence, is what you are guaranteed to receive. God's not stingy. He doesn't love you in drips and drops. He loves you extravagantly. God, your Father, has poured out the greatest gift you could ever receive through Jesus Christ. That's why Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, He who did not spare his own son, that's who you're praying to, the one who looked at you in your mess and in your sin and said, I'm going to send my son as a sacrifice for their salvation. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? When I need God, when I need his strength, and I doubt, I don't feel like his power and his presence are real, I can look at the cross and say, God did not spare his own son, but willingly gave me Jesus. How could I not trust him to get me through this? So God sent the Holy Spirit so we can, number two, choose to believe Christ is already within us. Remember what Jesus said in John 7, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And we're reminded of this opportunity we have in Revelation 3. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. 
the Holy Spirit living in us, our experience of God, I hope today you can step into a heightened level of expectancy of experiencing more of God no matter what your circumstances. And then to live in that peace. Third, finally, we get to choose to believe it's happening. We don't have to keep checking on whether or not God loves us. He does. It's done. It's decided. He's there for you. Today can be the day you discover the power of living by faith, not by feelings. As Eldred says, we begin by transferring the faculty of our belief from our feelings to our will. We choose to believe. I'm not downgrading feelings. Feelings are important. You need to pay attention to them. God gave you those feelings for a reason. They're telling you something. Listen. But if we try to live the Christian life by the way we feel, we will always have ample evidence telling us that God is not real and he's not close. That we're fools to make decisions as if he is. But as we choose to believe regardless of what we're going through, God will continue to supply his power and his presence to lead us through. And what I want for you is for living water, rivers of it to flow out of you through your experience with the Lord. Can we pray together? Father, my life, circumstances I find myself in, problems I don't know how to solve, things that I feel like I need and don't have, just the fragility of how weak I am in so many ways. At times, all of the stuff in my life amounts to this creeping anxiety. And when I get in that rut, I start to feel like you're not even there. And I think, am I a bad Christian? Like, it doesn't feel like God's power and presence are the reality of my life. And Lord, I hate that. Instead, I, I want to know, and I pray that you'll give me the gift of faith, and I choose right now to believe that no matter what's happening in my life or the world around me, that I can, because you promised us in Scripture, that I can experience more of you. I pray that you'll give me the gift of the Holy Spirit through my faith in Jesus. That increasingly, you'll teach me how to choose to live as though you're really real, that you're not just present at church, and you're not just present around me, but that through my faith in Jesus, you live in me by the Holy Spirit. And I pray that you'll help me to live a life that's governed by the Spirit so that my daily decisions, how I love you and how I love people, how I choose regarding my sexuality and my thinking and my feelings, all of these things can be subject to you. Teach me. Give me my faith back. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you like what you've heard, go ahead and subscribe right here. The playlist with all of our video content is right here, and you can access the video we've chosen next for you right here. From all of us at New Life, thank you for watching.